Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what he said, how to cooperate with his kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. to God. All right, well, what we're going to do today is we're going to continue uh, what we were talking about last week. Last week was called Them's Fighting Words. Since I know we're really going to, we're going to be busy next weekend, there's just a couple points I'm going to pick and choose from today and uh, to just get in our heads, not just I want some things to think about this week, but as we go into next week, we're going to talk about the integrity of the Word of God. And we're going to talk about what Jude had to say, Second Peter had to say about the Word of God and false teachers coming in. How many of y'all took some extra time to read and go through Second Peter and Jude just to kind of get your head in the game, right? Well, there's some things in there that are pretty awfully important. It's awfully important, A, to understand how the integrity of the Word of God and why it's given to us. And, and the second thing that's important is you better be careful who's teaching you because there's folks, as we've been learning, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, look, in the last days there's going to be folks that are going to devote themselves to doctrines of devils. They're going to be, because of their devotion, okay, to these bad, these lies, these terrible ideas of spirituality and how things work, they're going to be so practiced at teaching you how to think wrong, it's going to get in your head, and both of them admit many are going to be taken away from it. The writers admit that it's going to work on some of you. And I don't want that happening on my watch. And so in June, and thank you, by the way, for going through that. Dear Jude 3 and 4, dear friends... I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find I must write something uh, or must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once and for all time to His holy disciples, His holy people, and we've really been spending a lot of time understanding first. Urging is not, you know, if you got time, do this. This is, I mean, this is a plea from the man of God. You need to do this because the word of God, because the enemy is coming in. A lot of you don't even know he's coming in. He says, and we have to contend. We've got to fight. We've got to defend. We've got to protect the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. He's not changing anything. It doesn't matter if it's 2,000 years later and you got a politician who can get more votes. And for term number one, he says he, agree, he, he disagrees with one thing, but in his second term to get more votes, when the polls come out, says, no, I used to be against this, but now I think it's okay. And air, because I think it's okay, well, then certainly we can't be judgmental and critical. And was it did last week, did we bring up that uh, uh, Pastor uh, Bodie Balcom? said that he discovered, this is certainly uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, that there is an 11th commandment that many in the church have found. An 11th commandment. And this 11th commandment, did I talk about this last week or was it Wednesday? Okay. This 11th commandment is so powerful that it overrules the other 10. And he says, if you'll watch... The 11th commandment is simply, thou shalt be nice. <laughs> thou shalt be nice overrules, you shall have no other gods in front of me. Watch people explain it on these talk shows when they're asked, what do you think, what does God think about homosexuality? What does God think about God? Was Jesus the only way? And even when someone wants to tell the truth, it dies a thousand deaths in trying to explain and getting themselves out of it so it doesn't hurt as much, because thou shalt be nice. And we've got this idea, and here's the thing, the, the, the writers 
And those that were involved, like in the word of God, in their experience of Jesus himself, Jesus didn't even obey the commandment, thou shalt be nice. And so it's important. Why are we talking about this? Because the word of God, it's vital, crucial. Our spiritual strength and success depends on our knowing the word of God, the integrity of the word of God, and refusing. And according to the writer in the New Testament, all of us, friends, not apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, you, if you're in this room and Jesus is your Lord, you're supposed to be able to contend for this faith as much as the apostle and the prophet does. Which means you can't sit in church for years and be as ignorant today as you were two years ago. You can't do that. And if you've been going to a church, mine included, if you find you're going and you're not learning anything and I just keep wanting to make things simple and, and you know, because you'll hear people say, well, I just want to go to a place that keeps it simple. You wouldn't have survived Jesus' ministry because he didn't keep it simple all the time. Let alone Paul. You would never have survived their ministries. But if you're the same today than you were 2,000 years ago, you're not going to be able to do this. And see, this is a problem because, and remember last week, we went through the numbers. The numbers are clearly demonstrating not just our people deciding they just don't want to hang out in church anymore, but even what they believe is true directly contradicts what the Word of God has to say. 60% of born-again Christians now say Jesus is not necessarily the only way to God. Now, here's why, and I'll tell you how you would come to that conclusion. You would come to that conclusion because you think Jesus came to just give you a better religion. He didn't come to give you good versus evil. He came to give you life because you were dead. That's what he came. So the argument, and, all, and I've watched it, I've, I've shared with you guys, I watched from, with these guys on Bill Maher and Larry King and all that. They keep bringing it back. Well, the scriptures say Jesus is the only way. Stop. The, uh, it's not the argument because you're bringing it and you're, and you're allowing that person on TV to equate Jesus with Muhammad or Buddha or Gandhi. None of those individuals can give you eternal life. None of them can. They don't even claim to be able to give you eternal life. Jesus is the only one because that's what you lost. That's what had to be restored. Excuse me. And so the word of God is given to us so that we understand him who gives eternal life, not so we can have another religious system that makes us nice. And so this faith that was once and for all, which means how you're going to live is once and for all. Well, you know, the, the ancient Greek and this and that, and I was reading the interlinears and Wiest and Strong's. Can, can we just burn all that stuff up right now? Adultery meant adultery 2,000 years ago, and it means the same thing today. Stop thinking you're going to change your definitions because you've got a Google search and you can find some, uh, some out and left field article to make you feel better. These definitions were the definitions, male, female, heterosexuality, homosexuality, all of these things, they've always meant what they meant, and that's once and for all. You don't get to change it. And you wouldn't want to change it when you understand the Word of God is causing heaven to live out of you, not to constrain you in a religion till you die. In our pulpits, we've got to have, and, and, and the Lord's going to insist on it. There's full, all of us there's, that want God, we're waking up. We're waking up to realities of heaven and earth and, and hell. And, and, and listen, he is, he's raising up, and he, it, you as well, folks that will not compromise on what the Word of God says. It, if you're offended, I'm sorry only because I'll miss you, but bye. Because I got, listen, I have to stand in awe of him. I have to revere his name, and I'm not allowed to allow you to challenge him. Amen. That's why, and this is why you're on the earth, and this is why at the, at the beginning of his ministry, he's teaching these guys, yes, you better turn the other cheek. That's a good one. Yes, you better forgive. That's good. Oh, by the way, if you follow me, be ready to die. Dead people aren't afraid to say anything. And he loves us so much.
He loves us so much. Second Peter says this, you must pay close attention to what they, speaking of the, uh, uh, the writer, it's specifically it was the Old Testament, the prophets. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. The word of God is a light that's been given to us in this creation so that we really know how things are. And the last person that should be wondering, I wonder what God thinks about this, is a child of the Most High God, a Christian, when they have in their hands everything he wants you to know about what he thinks. And so we need to talk about this. And again, I'll just basic overview, give you some things to think about. But his presence is so strong on me right now. What a wonderful time. This is great. I loved it. I had a lot of fun last week teaching. I'm already having even more fun this week. This is good. And this is where change happens, though. Change happens. His words, see, what he does is he marries the words of the minister, whoever it is. It's my dog today. I'm up here, senior pastor. But what he does is my words are supposed to be spirit and life as much as his are. Because he's breathing them through me. He's, he's put in here. It gets filtered through my mind and my soul because I've meditated it out and prayed it out. Then when I speak it, it goes through the filter of my mind into words you understand. And then those words, the Holy Spirit's there to work with them. So inside your heart, you catch on fire. And it produces the change that it's supposed to produce. And I could just throw, out, throw that out there. Starting with me. No one's got any business taking a pulpit that doesn't know how to do that. They got no business preaching this gospel if they're not, they don't have fire. None. It's causing a lot of problems because people are believing things that just aren't right. They've heard good lessons, but they're not, they've never caught on fire. Even the motorcycles agree. So, if, the, if his words are this light that cause us to know this is the way it is, can we trust them? Yes. Okay. Can we trust him and through whom he spoke? And this is really the one, just the one thing I want to major on. We'll have some points on another, and then um, we'll be done. Got a busy day. Get us ready for next week, and then we'll get back up to the plate. So let's look at some things. 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 19. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. So, and we talked about this last week, and remember we looked at some more verses, and I'm going to give you some more verses. We're going to look at them and what the Word of God has to say, or the writers of the Word of God, what they had to say. But notice here, he says, we're not making up clever stories. In other words, the Bible is not a bunch of people that hung around just trying to come up with a religion. These are historically documented facts. They have been exhaustively studied to whether they're true or not. These guys are not saying we had, we, you know, we had legends passed on to us. We were there. We're eyewitness accounts. What we're telling you is we were there to see it, and we're telling you exactly what happened. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, uh, John said, he says again here in the third verse, this is in, um, that was in 1 John, this is in his gospel, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As for us, we cannot help speaking what we have seen and heard. Now, in, in the face of direct threats, uh, even against their lives, these guys said, we can't help but talk about it. You can't shut us up. How many Christians in this room have been shut up? And I'm wondering if the first gag that shut you up was your ignorance. You didn't even know how to answer. Well, you can't sit in a church any amount of time and have that be a problem. Either the preacher's inept or you're not doing your homework. 
Because remember, we're told to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. You are, right? Did I write this? No. No, but I admire the men that I did because anybody, and we'll appeal to it again, anybody that would go through the torture and the deaths that they did without denying a single thing, I'm going to pony up some respect for these people. After this, he was seen by more. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthian church. He was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we can keep going and going. I think this is the last one. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So do we see, can we intellectually, after just reading a few of the statements from these authors, intellectually, are, would we be able to go, you know what, they just made this stuff up. Just a bunch of stories. Just a bunch of metaphors. No, now, it should be able to be historically backed up, which it is, but can we look at those authors and go, you know what, I don't think I can trust them. No, because they saw, and they reap, and not only one, but even at one point, 500 people, they all told the same story over and over again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. I put this up last week. I changed some of the words. The notion that the Bible is only a collection of made-up myths, allegories, matters of opinion is ridiculous and intellectually weak. Nothing of what the authors claimed or taught is make-believe and has been exhaustively verified as well. They lost their lives to some of the most horrific and gruesome means of executions instead of recanting a single sentence. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the Philippian church, he said, you guys, he says, if I want to, I can go home now. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I'm not sure which one I want to pick. He says, to get out of here, that's good. To be with Christ has got to be much better than this flipping dungeon he's in. But to remain is more beneficial for you. He would regularly in his letters write, hey, don't, I, yep, you're right. I just got my head kicked in again. All right. Yep, that was my third time getting 39 lashes. Yep, I've had my feet broken many, many times. Put in the stocks, abused, cussed at, friends, countrymen, enemies. He says, I'll still stay, though, knowing that that was his, going to be, continue to be his lot in life because the devil hated him so much that he hired an assassin, a messenger, straight from Satan himself. Listen, you might have some mean people that don't like you because you love Jesus. Right, well, there was a personal, there was a spirit, specifically a messenger of Satan, specifically designed to take him out. And he told us why that was given to him, because of the abundance of the revelations. Jesus has shown me so much, this thing was sent, he has to try to kill me. That's why wherever I go, I keep running into these things. Listen, if this was not real, you want to tell me this, how this guy could have been in his right mind? For going, if I stay, because he knew what else was happening. Because this messenger of Satan was not going anywhere. But he decided, he says, don't worry about what's happening to me. It's for your glory. He says, it's for your benefit. In other words, the longer I'm alive and the more revelations I can pray out and the more understanding of the things of God I can bring to the earth, the more beneficial it is to the body of Christ today and until Jesus comes back. He loved the master and he loved the church so much that you couldn't do anything to him to get him to want to leave before his time. Do not try to tell me that these are just allegories and metaphors. Don't. And they shouldn't be able to do the same thing to you too. Parents, you need to sit down with your teenagers, even this service. Make them watch it. 
Make them watch this stuff. It's amazing. How, as you know, the studies are showing now. And by the way, um, and I've read more of that, but that's really a great book, Hollowed Out. There's some really, really great stuff in there. The, just the numbers of what technology and our society and our cultures are doing to our young adults, our youth and young adults. The phone now, the cell phone, that they have found now that even it does, and, and I don't want to hear about, well, I know Sister Johnny's second cousin twice removed who he's on his phone all the time and he gets straight A's. That's an anomaly. Because the numbers prove all your cell phones and all your distractions, even in church, is, being, is devastating. Did you know that most now, I forget, the, I'm trying to remember the, the percentage now, or it's a very high percentage of kids that go into the first year of college actually can't even take college courses yet because they need remedial training so they can even keep up with college because they're so far behind. I'll tell you what to do with your cell phone and your distractions. And parents, you have a job to do. We had an opportunity recently with my dearest grandson. Wonderful opportunity for him to be reminded once again, my eight-year-old grandson does not tell 58-year-old Papa what he thinks. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you want to do. I could care less especially since I'm pouring my heart into you and having you enjoy things and finance things for you and how important it is for, and I was saying, John 6, love, our family loves each other. We're very, very close. Don't ruin that by wanting to play your stupid game. And I didn't say this. I'll crack you over the head with it. And as well, did you know that all those video games you think are so cool? And it goes into adulthood. I know adults that are addicted to video games still to this day, to the, even to the, hurting their family. Did you know? And look, at this is true. Did you know that video game companies hire psychologists to work with the game so they can addict you and get a hold of your brain so it becomes a drug and you cannot stop? And you know why? Because you had a six-figure psychologist get in there and say, do this, and they'll get addicted and they won't be able to let it go. And they'll fight parents over it. They'll fight their teachers over it. They'll certainly find other things to do besides have an education. So one day if they do go to college, they suck up the first year usually of their parents' money Learning what you should have learned as a sophomore. Professor, have you run into any of this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a verse we're going to finish with today. <laughs> it's devastating. <laughs> I mean, it's devastating. This verse we're going to end today on. Let's keep going. And as Colonel Jessup, speaking of these men and giving their lives, and I had to adjust the wording a little bit, <laughs> show me some flippin' courtesy. You show Paul some courtesy. Teenager, atheist, you show Peter some courtesy for what they went through to not deny for a second what they heard and what they saw and what they were taught, even to the point of not only losing their lives, but even their families' lives. They put their families' lives on the block just as much as them because they would not change a single sentence of what happened. I'm going to show them some courtesy. And I'm going to pay attention to what they said they were told to say. Anybody ever hear of a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis? Okay, this is, the, this is the quote. Have you ever heard of the, it's called the trilemma? You ever heard that? This is from C.S. Lewis, and uh, <clears throat> it's from this statement that they call it the trilemma. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because we'll read it, and then you'll go, oh, yeah, okay, I've heard this before. But speaking of Jesus, the Word of God, and these things, and specifically about the Lord. Now, oh, and C.S. Lewis was an atheist. He says he was, I mean, he went kicking and screaming into coming to know God. Brilliant man, writer, um, um, what was the word? Uh, uh, philosophy, um, who's the guy, uh, like Shakespeare and all that. I'm, I mean, I'm really in the spirit right now. What would be the word for that kind of studies in, um, okay, when you think of it, let me know. Anyway, <clears throat> so here's what he had to say. 
I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, speaking of Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Well, Jesus was cool. I have my Jesus, my personal Jesus. Well, I know Jesus says this and stuff, but you know what? There's, there's many ways. To have, and 60% now born-again Christians believe that Muhammad can get you to God just as much as Jesus can. He does not allow you to do that. So, and whether it's Jesus or I'm bringing this in because certainly we have the Gospels, but we have what, we're reading what Jude had to say and Peter had to say and John had to say. So we can apply this principle, the things they said. Now let's watch. So I put the, uh, let's put it all together. We must both be cognizant and brutally honest with ourselves if we refuse to believe the scriptures. We must be willing to get in the face of Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, and condemn them as liars and fitting for the deepest pit in hell they claim is real. You got to be ready to do that. And that's okay. You have that right. You have the right to go, these guys were smoking crack or whatever they did 2,000 years ago. This, their continual reference to the resurrection. Listen, the cross, as necessary it was, the cross is incomplete without a resurrection because the resurrection was the ultimate victory of the cross. The resurrection of Jesus is the central point of fact all of christianity revolves around his deity and that he rose again from the dead to provide a salvation for us and these guys gave their lives for it so what what we have what you have to be able to do if you want to go well you know what i just i just i just don't believe it you don't have to believe it but if you're going to be intellectually honest you have got to be willing if you come to that conclusion about the scriptures is to go to jesus and go you are a filthy liar Paul, you lied. John, you deserve to go to the hell you talked about because you lied and said Jesus was the only way. I mean, let's be honest about this. Let's start, let's, let's open up our minds for a second and, co and co come to the conclusion of what you must say if you're going to go, I just don't think I can believe the word of God. Then you have to go and be able to get right in the face of these people and tell them you're a liar and all liars go to hell, by the way. Have a good time down there, Peter. And that's what you're saying. So, what's the big deal about that? Pastor Joe, why are you getting all fired up about the Word of God? And its integrity. I mean, don't you know that we're all just nice people anyway? Oh, and by the way, all those who go, well, I just don't think I can believe the Word of God, <laughs> be intellectually honest. Why do you follow any rules? Why do you follow any rules? Because if there is no God... Why do you even want to be a, a, oh, wait a minute, that's right. If there isn't, maybe the continual vomit of this stuff in the schools and in the media has gotten our young people so, uh, in, uh, so accepting of the idea there is no God. Of course they could care less what mom and dad have to say because if they could give a flip about what God says, do you think they're going to listen to you? You already let them stay in your house while they were 24, 25, and 26. Why should they move out when they're 35? Why should they get a job? Why? Let's just be honest about all this. 
Why have laws if there's no ultimate lawgiver? If there's not an accountability, well, it's for the good of society. Well, who decided who, what was good for the society? How did they, all of them rate? Well, it's wrong to steal. Well, what if I want what they have more than they want to keep it? <laughs> so what's the big deal? This is the big deal. This is where we, this, this is the last. <clears throat> I really wanted to emphasize what I did, but this gets us ready for this weekend and the rest of the time in the series. And I highlighted the, the word here. This is mine. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. In other words, these, what he, we're talking about here, this knowledge that you've been given is not to be nice, it's so you can be like your God. Not just in holiness, but in power and in wisdom. We are continually, behold the manner of love that God has given to us, that we should be called sons of the Most High God. The result of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is sums up, and we have able now the mind of Christ. We pray these mysteries up, this wisdom that was set aside for our glory, the glory that was given to us as sons. We can think just like he does. We have his nature like he does. And the book of Acts and those who believed afterward demonstrated they walk like he did too. I don't even know in the Gospels about Jesus' shadow healing people. You had that with Peter. These, these men, and, and women too, but mostly these men, they devastated their generation and they brought heaven to the earth and earthquakes opened up prison cells. Angels came and killed kings that wouldn't give glory to God. Certain guy was bragging about how big he was. His name was Herod. Angel said, We've had enough of that. Touched him and he just split and died. His guts opened right up. Oh, I can't wait to go to church. You sure when you start seeing some of that stuff happen? What happened? The, the, the doorway was wide open for heaven and earth working together. These men walked like their father and their eldest brother in the flesh, Jesus of Nazareth. So why is it so important that we have the Word of God? Because, how many, let me ask you this, how many of you all would just, would, you'd love to have more peace in your life? How many want more peace? Okay? How many would you like more grace? According to this verse, it's not what you can believe, it's what you know. Your brain's going to have to work. You're going to have to spend some time, and you're going to have to have your brain working, and you're going to have to put information in here because we're supposed to know not just him and his person. See, here's the thing. It's not just I can't know him. I'll even add that. I can't possibly know him if I don't know his abilities and capabilities, let alone participate in them. I don't have time to go to church. It's the same thing. That is the equivalent of saying I don't have time to go to school. I just don't have time to go, so I'll just be absent. Well, what's so more important in school? Call of Duty and blowing, got people's heads off? Because I don't know why, but I can't stop playing this game. I don't know what it is. It's like these games have control over me. I wonder if that was meant to be. I wonder if there was someone that was paid a lot of money to get me to be so controlled by this thing that I would even give up my personal responsibility as an adult so I can go and do this let alone not hang out in the house of God and learn something. Grace and peace are multiplied as you get to know God. His divine power has given us everything we need notice for a godly life through our knowledge who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given us his great and precious promises that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Participate means you get to enjoy, like you got to enjoy the sun, like you got to enjoy your car that got you here to church today. The divine, na the nature of God on the inside of you is meant to be enjoyed. 
It's meant to be participated in. This is a whole lot different than thinking church is about sitting you down and trying to get you and beating you into senselessness so you can just be nice. And that's why people would leave, wouldn't want to go to church. Who wants to sit there and be told how rotten they are all day? And even if I am rotten, can someone please tell me how to get something that's bigger than my rottenness? Can someone introduce me to a strong man that can come in and take the spoils from this thing that's in me that's stopping me from succeeding? That's why the Word of God, and this is why its integrity is so, it's crucial. And when someone says, well, I just don't know if I can believe. It's intellectually, you know what's, and what's really funny, or what's wrong about that, listen, have that question, and we have that going on today, but it happens all the time. I was doing it 30, no, no, I was in the ministry 30 years ago. <laughs> I was be careful about that. Let's see, when was that? I was like 30, I was like, about 35, 40 years ago. Well, you know what? I just don't know. But I paid the price to find out. I paid the friend. Do you remember that story I told you about a friend of mine who was, uh, um, same thing, because uh, it, it just happens over and over again. Good friend of ours who was, I was a youth pastor at the time at Household, Household of Faith, and um, he was coming to the youth group, and he's like, he's like, Pastor, I got to talk to you. He says, I'm losing my faith. And uh, I said, well, talk to me. What's going on? He goes, you know what? He says, you know, the, the biology and evolution and these things, they're really challenging what I believe. I said, I just don't know if I believe this stuff anymore about God as I'm learning about all the science. <laughs> Did you know scientists once said smoking was healthy for you? Yeah. Trust the science. Did you know science said that DDT could do nothing to you? Believe the science. And I said this, well, let me tell you what to do young man, my little apprentice, this is what I would do. I said, how much time are you giving to Darwin? Like, how much homework do you have to do? How much study and stuff like that? He says, oh, probably a couple hours. I says, look, God doesn't mind your questions. He doesn't mind. But what he does, what bothers him is when you're not fair. And if you're only, if you're giving Darwin two hours and you're giving God 10 minutes while you're in the shower going, you need to prove yourself to me, that's not right. That's dishonest. And so I said this, I said, I says, can you, can you make me a deal? Can you say that for every, and don't stop studying Darwin. Don't, you know, you've got school to go to. Don't stop. I says, but can you promise me that, that you will give equal amount of time to the scriptures as you give to this one class A that's getting you to unbelieve? He says, yeah, I can do that. Less than two weeks. He came back, says, I'm fine now. I'm fine. See, God doesn't, he doesn't, your questions are not going to bother him, and, it's, and it, it's, it's, it's not a good guy behind the man or woman behind the pulpit that says, you have to believe what I say because you have to believe what I say. No, go, research, study, but be fair about it, and let God have a chance to prove himself, and he will, because if your heart is right, see, you know why a lot of people don't want to study and do what they do? Because they don't want to, because they're comfortable and having their excuse not to have responsibility for their morality. Because, you know, this stuff, I'm just so offended about heaven. I'm offended about hell. Your offense doesn't change that they're real, and you're going to one of two of those places. The world, this society, this culture is trying to teach kids today that because they're offended, they can change the reality. No, you can't. Whether you're offended or not, it does not change what the truth is. You can get offended at me as a pilot when I say, put your seatbelt on. And by the way, we're not flying with the door open because you might fall out. <laughs> you can get offended all you want. If I let you do it, you're, you're offense nothing. You're falling out. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and yet our world is so altering, making you think you can alter reality to such a degree. And they do it with church history and church doctrine, and they're doing it with the United States as well. Because if you feel that your reality is based on your experience, not objective truth, you've got a problem. And now all of a sudden, I have to become my own God. You get into a world with your reality, I'm going to have a problem now because your reality conflicts with mine. Now we have all these little gods running around fighting for their own reality. Why do you think we're in the mess that we're in? Through the knowledge, having escaped, look at this, 
having escaped. This is, this is the word used when it comes to no longer being controlled by this world and its media and its entertainment and its passions. He uses the word, you've escaped that. These passions that are being ignited in you, in you as you continually feed it through all these means, these are meant to be escaped, not shoved in your arm, keeping you sidetracked until you turn 70, 80, 90 years old, and you go, ah, and you put your body off, like you take off a glove, and there you stand in one of two places. So we'll start wrapping up. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from people's own understanding. Until an individual comprehends that this world is not all there is, or is the way that it is, he or she will be severely handicapped in their ability to have the God kind of success in life we were all destined to experience. The earth is not all there is right now. The earth is not. There's angels in here. Do you know that? And there's demons here too. Well, pastor, is that sacrilegious? How can Satan come immediately to steal the word if he's not there to pay attention to what you've been hearing? I know he's watching me. Greater is he that's in me, though. He knows what you're being accountable to. And you know what he's also doing? See, he's measuring what comes from that pulpit because he's got to know what tactics he's got to use against you and me to stop what God wants to do. He has to pay very close attention to what's coming from that pulpit. How did he know to say to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if he wasn't there to hear the Father say at the baptism, behold my beloved Son? How did he know to challenge that if he wasn't there to see what happened? And even if it wasn't him personally, those devils that were possessing those people that were all around him, I don't think word didn't get back to the king. Stuff's going on in here all the time. This is not all of there is. And I'm, I, with everything I have is to just, and I love you, but to, to wake and shake and encourage and even poke and prod sometimes. Because here's what happens. Forget, if you get one, two, five, ten, what if you got 200, 300? What if you got 500 people so sensitive to the things of God? I can tell you what happens. <clears throat> you get loosed. You get let go from preaching the gospel. You go to your own companions. And you pray, why are the nations raging? Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and let signs and wonders be done by your service. Let us speak boldly. And that entire building shook. That's what happens in church when people are schooled on how this stuff works. Instead of sitting there going, I just think I'm too tired today. What an invasion Goffstown deserves from us. Gosstown and where and Bedford, this area, and well, in the world, and Jesus has got boots on the ground everywhere, and he's taking care of all these other churches. We're partial to this one. This town deserves a move of God. And it's going to take knowledge. Knowledge. To know that this earth is not all there is. What a privilege. One of the things I was going to put it on Facebook today, we're wrapping up. I was going to put it on Facebook today. Another thing that C.S. Lewis is, if you got, well, you want some really, really cool quotes, look up C.S. Lewis. And he was talking about coming to Christianity. He says, this is the last place you want to come to if you want to be comfortable. And I know that there are things that I say sometimes. I know. I know. but I have to revere him. I have to stand in awe of his name. I have to teach you not to sin. I have to teach the law needs to be on my lips. The knowledge of the most high needs to be on my lips and in this room. That's what I have to do. This is why I'm here. And I know sometimes he's like, is he going to keep messing with my call of duty? I try to lighten it up with some humor. It's an anesthetic, but it doesn't change the fact. Play Call of Duty. I actually don't. I hate that game, <laughs> but there's other games. I just never understood playing a game where you win by blowing someone's head into pieces. Have those things. I have my games. I have my fun. 
Most of my fun is Ken. <laughs> we, 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 okay, it's Ken. <laughs> okay, I got it. Enjoy our lives, but we can still have a passion, right? A hunger for God. Is this where we go? Clearly, experiential grace and supernatural demonstrations are dependent on our education in otherworldly realities. Satan knows this, and from the very beginning, normally begins his assault on the human mind with these four words. Did God really say? And that's who you're in bed with. When we decide that we're not going to give these people courtesy and intellectually analyze not just what they said, but did they really earn the right to say those things? And ha have they been backed up? Today, are, they repeat are the promises repeatable? Yes, they are. But this is where he starts it. And now, this is, here comes the devastating verse. That's not the verse. <laughs> Doing that is going to cost you. And here's the verse. <clears throat> you guys ever heard of a guy by the name of Jeremiah? Yeah, he had some things that the Lord had to say through, to Israel through him. Okay, and this is where we end in my one observation. Okay, you want to keep sleeping with him or it, it's going to cost you. And you tell me, those of you who experience, not just in matters of spiritual things, but in natural governmental things as well, are you ready? Here's the verse. We're going to keep this in front of us for a while. Not today for a while, but. Jeremiah 18, 15, 16. Yet my people have forgotten me, and they've offered sacrifices to worthless idols. Karl Marx. This makes them stumble along in the way they live and leave the old, reliable paths of their fathers. They have left them to walk in bypaths in roads that are not smooth and level, so their land will become an object of horror. If you decide that you don't want to listen to the paths of the fathers that have been proven out for thousands of years, you are, it's going to cost you. The father said who could get married. The father said how you're going to have sex. Oh, and by the way, sex is awesome. But you know, the apostle Paul dealt with it in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. He goes like this. He goes, because the Corinthians were going, well, you know, the stomach for food and food for the stomach. Do you, even, do you know what he was saying? What he was dealing was, and we have the same thing today. People are going, well, wait a minute, it's just an appetite. Like if I'm hungry, I eat. If I want to have sex, I have sex. And he's like, you no, know, this is the one thing you can't think like. He says, because all the other sins deal with your body, you are the body of literally the flesh and bones of Christ himself. How dare you think you can join your body to someone you're not married to? He opened up our eyes to show us sex is not an appetite. It is a glorious demonstration of Jesus and his child in union one to another. And do not take this thing that is so unique and so special and so divine in its activity. Sex can create an eternal being. The only thing eating too much will be cause a problem in the bathroom the next day. But they were doing the same thing they were doing today. Well, I just feel it. Listen, when sex is no more to you than a plate of nachos, we got a problem. And that's exactly what's happening. The numbers are now showing there's such a callousness to the deed. Now, did you know that the numbers are showing that people are actually having less sex than they ever did before? Because the uniqueness of it. What it's meant to do. And the obligation and loyalty it would demand to another person. 
reason why that is not a simple appetite, that's not what it is. Oh, food for the stomach, stomach for the food. And he was, and listen, nothing's, people are the same. There's nothing new under the sun. America has not come up with anything new. And in the beginning, God said, I will create man in my image, male and female. I have created them. That's a path of the, that's a reliable path of the fathers. You can't have a psychologist who 20 years ago thought you had a mental condition thinking if you're a boy, now you can become a girl. You don't get to change that. Now that doesn't undo the fact, hey, look, we are, I'm here to be a friend to anybody dealing with anything. But you do not get to go in there and leave the old reliable paths of their fathers because now you, th you think it's healthy for someone to have up to, what, 70 identities now? Are you going to tell me anyone in their right mind thinks that's actually healthy for someone? The old reliable paths of their fathers, and how did they get those? The Word of God. The Word of God. And so their land will become an object of horror when burning down whole city blocks is okay and are mostly peaceful protests. <laughs> this will make them stumble and their land will become an object of horror. Whether it's critical theory and Marxist indoctrination to assault and rewrite and abolish the principles of our founders, or the barrage of revisionism even from the pulpit concerning the integrity of the Word of God and its definitions and standards, neither saint nor nation can survive and the results will be catastrophic. And God himself guarantees that. This makes them stumble along the way and they leave the old reliable paths of their fathers. You cannot change the word of God. You have no authority to change the word of God. When you try to do that and you leave the paths that have been well established, definitions that have been known for thousands of years, you think you can do that? You are causing a major problem. Oh, and this is where we'll leave. Do you think maybe we might want to spend some time in Second Peter and Jude and find out what happens to those teachers that teach you it's okay to leave the old reliable paths of the fathers. Pastor, that was kind of harsh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Also to its logical conclusion, does that mean if it's true that they heard and they saw that Jesus rose again, He's the Lord. He's the King. He's God. Does that mean everything he said, like when the word says the prayer of faith will heal the sick? You mean I can be as uncompromising in believing that as well? You mean in Matthew chapter 8 when he healed all the sickness and all the demons came out and then Matthew come and miss, we got a Holy Spirit commentator who said this all happened that it would be fulfilled surely he bore our sickness and carried our pains. You mean to tell me that I can cast all my cares upon the Lord because he cares for me? You mean I don't have to be afraid anymore because I don't have a spirit of fear but power, love and sound mind. This is why this message is important. It doesn't matter if you're uncomfortable if we deal with some crap that's going on in our culture right now. When you can trust, when you know that you know you can trust the Word of God, there isn't an ailment or a devil that'll come after you that you will not walk all over because His Word is true. Amen. His Word is true. His Word is true. And Lyme is underneath the blood. That's true. Amen. Doesn't matter how you feel. It's true. Amen. His word is true. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just, we rejoice. We rejoice and we're so grateful for the word of God. 
We're so grateful that you knew when they were created. You knew when Peter was being brought to the earth, the torture he was going to go through to defend our Lord's name. You brought Jesus into this world knowing what he was going to go through to demonstrate and to give us evidence and confidence that you love us and everything that you say is true. And so, Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you. I determine with the light that I walk in, I determine every meeting that I have to be faithful to the integrity of the word of God and give my life resisting those who either in my country or in my church want to change the old ways of our fathers that have been given to us through you. And Father, I thank you for a church that is able to contend earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. A church filled with folks that are schooled in the spirit so that when we get together, our services aren't ending with quiet and peace and no one knows what to say. That's awesome. But what's better is when we start having earthquakes and angels showing up and fire catching on people's heads. Father, I thank you that your word is true. This is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.